Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. Well, first of all, I got a haircut. Turns out uh, I have a local fan by the name of Danny that I'd like to give a shout out and thank him for taking me in his shop to finally trim down this whole, uh, what was that movie with, uh, with, what's his name, Stranded on the Island with the volleyball? Yeah, that's what I started to look like. In either case, got a lot of questions, got a big backlog. You guys keep asking me questions and I appreciate it and I'm gonna try to do my best to get to as many as possible. And please remember to email me now, romansharf at luxurybazaar.com. Uh, let's jump right in. The first one is from Karate Chop, and this is another challenge. Whenever I get an email where the subject says new challenge, I don't read it, so I can sort of go with it and answer the stuff off the top of my head. I feel like it comes out better. Uh, so, what the hell is wrong with my lights? That's not good. Right now, what's happening is our new studio is being built directly behind my office, and I think they turned off the lights, so we'll be back after these messages. <laughs> Okay, so the lights are back. Back to the challenge from Karate Chop. This is his third challenge to me now. And as I said, I don't read it the minute I see new challenge in the subject line. And by the way, if you guys are gonna ask me a question and give me a challenge, put new challenge on top. That way I won't read the email and it'll just come off off the top of my head. Uh, hi Roman, I hope you and your close ones are safe and well, thank you. I've got another challenge for you. You need to procure and supply watches to the following celebrities according to their needs. Number one, really. Queen Elizabeth at the Royal Gala. Number two, Elon Musk's Everyday Watch. And number three, Killian Bappi on a night out. You must use all your resources and skills to find the perfect match. Good luck, hope you have fun. Well, for one, I would love to have these people to reach out for me for watches. Killian Bappi, maybe. Elon Musk, long shot. Queen Elizabeth, probably not at all. So Queen Elizabeth at a Royal Gala. I think that Queen Elizabeth would look great in a gem set watch, but not just a gem set watch, but a watch that's entirely made up of diamonds. Uh, something that I showed on one of the previous uh, what's on my desk, it was a Piaget, if you remember, that was all but gets simply with like a bracelet. But if, because this is a queen, I think you go with the Vacheron, and specifically you go with the Vacheron Kala, and you go with the Lord Kala. The Lord Kala is the biggest diamond piece that they make. The diamonds themselves are much bigger, the baguettes themselves are much bigger, and it's the biggest size. Uh, I don't know Queen Elizabeth's wrist size. I would imagine the lower column may be a bit big for her, but you can always take out links. But that would be the watch I would choose for Queen Elizabeth at the Royal Gala, because the Lord Kala from Vacheron is about as royal as it gets, if you ask me. Uh, Elon Musk's everyday watch. Hmm. So Elon Musk is not the guy that ever cared for money. I mean, you're talking about a guy that when Tesla was coming around, the story is that he literally took the last of his money that he made from PayPal and dumped it all in there, not knowing whether he's going to be broke the next day or become a multi-billionaire, right? Elon Musk is the future, and that's all Elon Musk cares about. So playing off of the futuristic vibe, I would probably sell him an MBNF. MBNF has those futuristic vibes, right? And specifically, I would go with the horological machine number nine because this design was based on aerodynamics of cars from the 40s and the 50s. And if you look at the watch, you'll see what I'm talking about. I think it speaks of two things. It speaks of cars, which obviously Elon Musk and Tesla go hand in hand, and as well, and again, the futuristic design. Uh, the other choice I would give him, the, it would be the horological machine number seven, which looks like a flying saucer, right? Something out of space. So SpaceX, Tesla, again, I would give him a choice between uh, an MBNF watch that was inspired by car design, as well as one that was inspired by space exploration. And last but not least, Mbappe. For all you guys that don't follow soccer, uh, Mbappe is a rising star, currently playing forward for League One for Paris Saint-Germain team, and he's also obviously part of French national team. Young kid made his professional debut at the age of 16. He was League One Player of the Year, and he got the Golden Boy Award in 2017. And his transfer was 180 million euros, making him the second most expensive player and the first most expensive teenager. So. Here's a young kid, rising star, has a lot of money, 
what does a kid like that want to do? He's most likely going to want to show off, right? And by show off, I don't mean to show off his wealth, but he's going to want something that's latest, greatest, young, hip, and that would be a Richard meal. Of course, the first thing I would offer him would be the RM30 that was made for the Paris Saint-Germain club, right? It's the blue and red uh, RM30 that's made in the colors of the team. But with that said, you know, these guys do tend to move around, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if I would necessarily want them to be stuck, right? So that would be one of the options I would offer him. So Richard Mille would be the one watch I would try to sell him. Uh, that would be one of the options. And the second option, Sky would be the limit. I would simply ask the guy on a budget, and you would think a guy like that doesn't have a budget. Everybody has a budget. Just because you're worth millions of dollars doesn't mean you want to spend a million dollars on watches. But depending on his budget, if you set his budget high, I would get him something uber rare. Let's say like a crystal turb, like an RM56 105 made, right? Or maybe scale it down to around a million bucks to uh, the new TPT Skull in white. I think that's a great turbion. If the guy only wanted to drop a couple of hundred thousand, I would give him the option of any of the newer RM1103s in TPT cases, either the white or red or black, the multitude of variations that are out there. But the answer is very simple. I would sell him a Richard Meal. Hope you guys like my choices. Comment below if you think otherwise, or if you may have any other ideas, I will welcome them as well. And if any of you guys know any of those three people, tell them to give me a call because I would certainly love to sell every single one of them some watches. Any of you guys uh, friendly with Queen Elizabeth by any chance? <laughs> In either case, let's move on to some questions. And, and Karate Chop, thank you again for a great challenge. Next question from Harshit Podar. And I do believe I've answered his question before. And this is talking about maintenance and stuff. Do you have any equipment that you would recommend I could use with regards to removing the straps on watches? Also, there are some precautionary measures I should take to avoid unnecessary damage. I only ask because I've never owned a hardware box in my life. In India, we have people that do everything for us. Unfortunately, that makes us very reliant on others. But with regards to my watches, I want to begin doing things more on my own. I feel like I have a watch collection, but I'm highly underprepared to have it. I don't have any gloves or screw set, driver sets. I probably don't have a watch mat like the ones I see in London Watch Collectors Challenge. The only thing I have on my watches, some of the boxes, they came in some papers and a couple of big watch boxes, which I'm sure aren't that good. Okay, well, this whole preparation of becoming a, a watch collector, throw that out the window. There's, there's no need to prepare for anything. I'm in the business. Oftentimes, I have to take out links, change straps, and things of that nature. I do have a jeweler that sits downstairs that can do that for me, but I can also do it myself. I'm a firm believer of being able to do everything for yourself. In fact, during this quarantine, I built an entire garden with my son. Not bad, but the main thing about it is that I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. And I also do have people that can do stuff for me. I, I can hire certain people to do certain tasks, certain construction projects. But ever since I was a kid, I was never afraid of holding a hammer, right? Which is why I was never afraid to mess around with watches as well, for simple tasks, obviously. I want my son to grow up and be able to put a nail on the wall. You know, nowadays you see some kids that can't even do that, and that's a shame. My, my son knows how to use all power tools. And as you can imagine, with the garden that we built, he learned a lot more. And then um, I'm confident to let him out in the world knowing that you know, if he needs to hang up a shelf in a house, he can't. But anyway, back to the watches. I, told, I showed you guys before, I use these virgin tools, right? These are the screwdrivers that I use, and you can find them online. These are the best. There's really nobody better out there than them, or at least not ones that I have found. Uh, and that I will use when it comes to changing links. And the, and the trick is to find the right screwdriver size for the right screw. And you don't have to be a professional to do that. If the screwdriver fits neatly and tightly into the screw, that's how you know you have the right opening. Worst case scenario, you can Google and see what size screwdriver you need for that particular screw for a model. As far as strap changes are concerned, depending on the straps, right? I have this nifty little tool, and all this little tool has is just basically a couple of pins, right? So if I'm doing a Rolex, let's say, and it has two of those pins in there, I'll pop the one pin in, apply pressure, pop the other one out, and the bracelet will come right off, right? You also have these same pins with a pitch, uh, with a fork-like ending, and that's gonna allow me to remove pins on a watch that has a leather strap, or I'll simply take the largest screwdriver possible, slide it in, pop that pin right open. Mats, I don't have a mat. This thing that's on my desk now, this, this was a desk calendar. I don't really use a desk calendar, but I did use this for the very purpose of me working on these watches. If you look on the top of it, you'll see markings where I press things down with a screwdriver. See all these? Like this is me working on watches, right? My desk is wooden, so I wouldn't really want to do on this, but this will never scratch a watch. It's just a leather pad. It isn't anything special or particular to watches. Gloves, I don't use gloves, right? 
Watches are not stamps, right? You have to come to the expectation that if you're going to change the strap, odds are you're gonna put a hairline scratch on the inside of the lug of the watch, right? A trained individual who's done it a million times, such as myself, I can do it without scratching up the watch whatsoever, right? But for the most part, as an individual, don't be afraid to dig in there, pop that pin open, change your strap, and put it back in there. Just because you put a scratch on the inside of the lug of your watch, what's the big deal, right? It's, it's, it's pretty obvious that that happens when you change out the straps. And sometimes even the most trained professionals will do it and still leave a scratch. Of course, there are other tools out there that you can buy that will squeeze both pins together, minimizing the risk of scratching the watch up. But I've done this so many times that I don't really need that. I just take a regular screwdriver, I'm able to catch the one end of the pin further away from the case and squeeze it out enough to where it just pops right out. But even still, when popping the new pin back in, odds are you will hit the inside of that lug. But as I said, that's really not a big deal. The worst thing that happens, a lot of times guys that have an untrained hand, that pin will scratch the top of the lug and that becomes unattractive. But at the end of the day, again, it can just be buffed out. So there are two ways you can do this. Go out there and buy yourself that tool for pins and go out there and buy yourself a set of screwdrivers or again, stop by a local watchmaker to have them done if you're not uncomfortable. Just remember, even if you mess up, the worst thing that can happen is you can buff those scratches out on the inside of the lugs or even on the outside. Hope that helps. So there was a question from a gentleman named Simon whom I replied via email. He was actually looking for something particular, but I wanted to bring this question up because I'm sure a lot of you guys would like to know that. Roman, I've been researching subs from the late 80s to 90s, trying to work out which is the most likely to go tropical. I live in Guam, so the watch is going to get a good dose of UV light if wear on a daily basis. Alternatively, I could leave it on the window sill and forget about it. I realize there's no rhyme or reason behind a dog going tropical. I'm just to have a bit of fun. What model do you suggest or do you have in stock? Cheers. So my reply to the gentleman was, is there is rhyme or reason to dials going tropical, right? 80s, 90s watches are unlikely to go tropical. A tropical dial by true definition is a black dial that has aged naturally and not from moisture or sun. It's contrary. The sun will not turn your dial brown. And this simply had to do with the type of paint or lacquer that was used on that particular dial, which is why we see only certain reference from certain years that can actually go tropical. You don't see a Speedmaster from 66 or 67 turn tropical, but you will see a Speedmaster from 1969 that will turn tropical, and again, due to the paint and the lacquer that they used in the particular dial. And then in 1971, they went back to normal, and that watch will never turn tropical unless you do something funky with it, like, I don't know, burn it or try to paint it. I wrote another thing too, because a lot of guys also refer to the loom, to the loom becoming yellowed or patinaed, and a lot of guys confuse that with a tropical dial, and there's really not much you can do to make that age faster. That's just gonna age on its own, right? The sun isn't gonna help. There's actually no proven method to make them patina faster, and it's actually quite the opposite of what people think. They would think it's the sun, and now it's the lack of sun that would make them patina faster. So I hope this sheds a little bit of light to you guys on tropical dials, right? You have to find certain references that had certain lacquer or paint on the dials that actually have a chance of turning brown, and most likely a lot of them are already gonna be tropical, and this is why a lot of these vintage pieces that have a tropical dial that tend to demand a humongous premium because there was only so few of them left and all the other ones out there don't have a chance to ever turn brown or tropical as they like to call it. And that's why the tropical dials demand the humongous premium in the vintage world. You can look that information up online as far as what watches, what references actually can be tropical or cannot be tropical. The information is out there. I hope this sheds a little bit of light into this topic because I, I, do, I do feel like a lot of you guys uh, would want to have an answer to that as well. Here's a great one from a gentleman named Eduardo who is a pilot in Mexico. Hey Roman, I've been watching your videos for about a year and I'm learning so much from your channel. I started this hobby many years ago. I'm almost 40 and this is really my passion. My favorite brand is AP, kudos. Uh, at the time, I only have my 15400 white silver dial. I just wanted to share with you that this, is, this piece I got at a nice boutique in Paris has been the love of my life and I think I will never sell it. People here in Mexico are killing for this watch and have I have received a couple of tempting offers, but when I remember that this watch was on my wrist when I saw my two boys being born at the hospital, or just to say that I bought this watch celebrating my first 5,000 hours as a pilot, people won't get the meaning of this piece for me. Have you ever sold something that's kind of personal value to you, even in times like this when finances are a threat, especially to an airline pilot like me? Same story with my 2019 GMT root beer that I recently bought. I made my first flight over the Pacific Ocean to Japan as a Boeing 787 commercial pilot. It was epic. 
Anyway, I would like to hear from you your opinion on this kind of emergency sales, and I would like to share my most important statement when it comes to buy watches. Buy a watch because you like it, because it fits you, and because you can afford it. Best regards, my friend. Hope to meet you someday, Eduardo. Awesome story. To answer your question is, I have never, thank God, been in the position where I had to sell off something that's near and dear to my heart. In a case of an emergency where you own certain assets that are of value, such as watches or maybe some antiques or a fancy car or something of that nature, if you're in a position where you need the money and need to sell something off, then by all means, in my book, you know, my family or the well-being of my family comes first. So if, God forbid, I have no food to eat and I have a particular Rolex or a 15400 that I need to sell in order to do so, then by all means, that's what I would do. I certainly hope you're not in that situation. But to answer that question, yes. If there's an emergency situation where finances are needed on an emergency basis, then certainly I don't see an issue with selling off anything of value, if you ask me. And I'm hoping that myself or any one of my viewers or you guys are never in that position where you actually have to sell something off that's near and dear to your heart because it could get worse, right? I, I've heard of people selling off family heirlooms because they needed the money. A watch that may have been passed down three, four, or five generations, right? Uh, but again, if you're in a position where you don't really have any other choice, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I do love your saying, uh, buy because you like it, because it fits you, and because you can afford it. Uh, where me, it's, you know, buy what you like first and foremost within the means that you can afford. So we're very close on that theory. Eduardo, thanks for reaching out, and I hope that answers your question. Next question comes from Pat from the Philippines. Hello, thank you for your transparency on your industry. I used to believe only buy in authorized dealers, but after watching and listening to you, I now will only buy from great market legit watch traders. Well, you shouldn't do that. I'm not, I, didn't, I never told anybody not to buy from authorized dealers. What I said is that Get it. If you get a good enough deal from an authorized dealer, there's nothing wrong from buying from them either. So at the end of the day, it's buying from legit sellers, whether he's an authorized dealer or not, as long as the deal is there and the deal is right and the watch you want is there. Uh, do you have any watch box or watch case recommendations? Is the watch box by Louis Vuitton great? What about the other brand? Have you heard of Scatola del Tempa? Uh, the watch from Louis Vuitton is great. Uh, one of the reasons it's, it is great is because it looks great, and I happen to be a fan of Louis Vuitton. I have a lot of old vintage Louis Vuitton trunks, and I do have two cases from Louis Vuitton, one a jewelry case and one a watch case. It's a great case, but it's expensive as all hell, and it's not going to be any better than a watch case you can buy for a couple of hundred dollars that's also made out of leather. It's just not going to be Louis Vuitton, and it's not going to look as great. And one of the things I will tell you about Louis Vuitton is that a lot of that stuff actually retains value. Like I have some old trunks that I bought over the years that actually gone up in value. Louis Vuitton does resell, especially some of the older stuff. But for the most part, it's just a question of whether you want to have a $5,000 Louis Vuitton watch box or a $200 no-name box, right? They'll serve the same purpose of storing your watches on a pillow. It's not a big deal. Uh, Scatola del Tempo, yes, I've heard of Scatola del Tempo. I've sold quite a few Scatola del Tempos, a lot of their winders. They have a really, really cool one that looks like just a bunch of gears put together. And at the end of the day, I've, I've said it before, watch winders to me are just an accessory to look good, right? Unless you're someone that has a, a ton of perpetual calendars that you don't wear all the time and they stop, there's, I don't really see a big use of perpetual calendars. Most watches, if they're not an automatic, you can just wind them, right? If they're on, if they're on automatic and you wear them, they're going to continually go on for you. For the most part, it's an accessory. You know, those that tell you, oh, it's necessary to have a... It's necessary to have a watch winder, right? It's not, right? Again, a perpetual cal is the only one that's a pain in the neck to set once it stops. And again, if it stops for a day or two, it's not a pain in the neck to set. If it stops for a couple of years and you gotta sit there and set the entire perpetual calendar, yes, it does become a bit of a pain in the neck, but it still can be done. So Scatola de Tempo, they do make great winders. They look great, Italian company, well quality made, unlike some of the stuff you see online for two, three hundred bucks. Those things are a waste, they break. So if you are somebody that wants a winder, I certainly would recommend Scatola. They're really, really great. Watch maintenance, how long before you service a watch? Is it similar to a car when you have to bring it in for scheduled maintenance or is it in proportion to how one wears his watch or is it about the watch brand in general? Some brands tend to take brown like the older AP Offshore chronographs. I've talked about this before, guys, and I, I mentioned in one of my previous videos, I have a 45-year-old Rolex Submariner single red that I wear a lot, right? A watch that I took to Aruba when swimming with and so on and so forth. I've had that watch over 10 years. I haven't serviced it yet. My rule of thumb is you service a watch when a watch needs service. All these maintenance schedule, maintenance things that these companies want you to do is just a way of them to make an additional income because they charge an arm and a leg for it, right? They have the mini services, the big services, the five-year service, the seven-year service. 
these things are made and they're made well. There's a reason why they're, so, why they're so expensive. And this whole service thing that people get hung up on, again, it's for your own peace of mind. But if your watch is running fine, regardless of how often you wear it, what is the point in five years to send it into the manufacturer for them to take the watch apart, literally wash it, put new oil in it, reseal it, test it on a couple of machines and send it back to you and charge you three grand. There's really no point. If your watch is ticking fine, let it continue ticking. I have a few old Russian watches, like from back to Soviet Union era, they're, they're mechanical watches. These things are like 60, 70 years old, and guess what? They still run, they still run fine. When they stop running fine, I'll give it to my watchmaker and see what's up. Now, sometimes you can damage your watches and the watch will stop. Maybe you dropped it or maybe you hit it against something. Doesn't matter, maybe something happened due to use. Then you wanna have them serviced, right? But at, for the most part, this regular schedule maintenance is that these things are not like cars, right? You don't change the brakes on your car for five years. The odds are you're not gonna be able to stop at a light, right? You don't change your oil, your engine will seize. Here, this is not a vehicle, right? This is a watch and it's a watch that's very, very well made. My rule of thumb is, service your watch when it needs service or when it actually breaks. Hope that answers your question. Uh, I'm gonna take one more before I get out of here from Derek. Uh, Derek asks a few questions. Uh, number one, Takura Carrera. There are so many variations and I saw one on another channel that I would love to own as a daily beater. Jack Hoyer Limited Edition CV2117. The red second hands just pops. Can you share your knowledge on the brand and how they trade vintage and why there's so many variations, special editions with Tag Heuer on the dial, some with Heuer on the dial, etc. I'm not gonna get into the details of Tag Heuer, but I did an entire video on the history of Tag Heuer, and that's gonna shed a lot of light into the question that you're asking. I'll have Ian link that below. You can check that out, and if you guys didn't catch it, check it out. I'm a big fan of Tag, especially some of their older stuff before they sold, right? Uh, so definitely check that out. Number two, AP, your favorite brand. You mentioned in one of your videos about AP with the rubber clad bezels and their quirks. I was looking on the AP site for some lady watches. I'm thinking of purchasing for my wife. Question is this, can you tell me about the Royal Oak Lady Cat Chrono with the mother of pearl subdials and do they exist on the market today and thoughts? I love the Lady Cat Chrono. So Audemars Piguet, when they, were, when they were going through the whole craze of the limited edition offshores, they didn't forget about the ladies. You guys have seen my wife wear the Lady Alinghi limited edition offshore. It is an offshore, which, which is a bigger size than the Royal Oak, thicker and bigger. And uh, it was limited to 500 pieces. Alongside that, they made another few limited editions, and one of them was the Lady Cat that you just mentioned, right? Seemingly, I've always told you guys that ladies' watches don't really tend to hold their value, but for some reason, the ladies' offshores do because they were limited. Why? The Lady Alinghi is my wife's favorite watch, right? Right? She will never sell that watch, no matter what. Even if she stops wearing it as often, she will still not sell it. And this is what happens with the majority of women out there. When they get something and they love it, they don't get rid of it. They're not like, guys, I'm going to trade it up and get this, and then I'm going to spend some more money on this and add and get a bigger watch. They don't care. They fall in love with an item, not due to its price, not due to its brand, but due to the fact that they love the particular timepiece, right? So that's why when they made 500, I mean, let's say 500 made it out there on ladies' wrists, Odds of me getting one again are slim to none. Same thing goes with the lady can. Uh, as far as uh, the quirks of rubber clad bezels, yes, they do tend to get beat up, right? If, you, if you're someone that doesn't wear their watches carefully, you know, and you take a chip out of a rubber bezel, I can't polish that. I can't add rubber back to it. The only way to do it is to replace the bezel, and that can cost a pretty penny. Also, over time, rubber dries. Now, as far as uh, the quirks of rubber bezels, yes, it's true. Rubber bezels, you have to be careful with. If you bang them against the wall, take a chunk out of that rubber, there's really nothing you can do with the exception of replacing the bezel, which gets expensive. Uh, my wife has had her rubber clad for close to 10 years now, uh, and she doesn't really wear her watches careful, and there's no chunks taken out of that bezel because you really have to do something bad in order to take a chunk out of that rubber bezel. Dings, yes because this is not a full rubber clad bezel. You do have sort of that inner bezel where the diamonds are that sort of protects the rubber. It's sort of on the outer edges. So you have much less of a chance of messing that bezel up, let's say on a men's rubber clad that has the full rubber bezel, right? Uh, rubber also tends to dry over time, right? In 20 to 30 years, that rubber piece will dry out, much like the rubber seal around the bezel where the bezel goes on. It doesn't mean you still have to replace this, but it's gonna, what happens is it starts to look a lot shinier, right? Uh, it starts to look a lot shinier and it has a bigger chance of then cracking literally cracking, right? I've seen rubber straps do the same thing over the years on Panerai's APs and things like that. When you bend the strap and you see a bunch of cracks, right? As far as the Royal Oak Lady Cat Chrono, you would, we would have to find you one. 
Uh, it's not something that would come across often. I think the last one I, time I had a lady cat was probably probably more than a year ago. But they do come around once in a while. Not as easy to find, but it, they can be found. They are out there. You're not going to find a new one. You will find a pre-owned one. But certainly something that can be found, and I absolutely love the watch. In fact, I love every limited edition ladies offshore, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the lady jeans, I love. Uh, the suede, I love. The lady cat, as you mentioned, I love. The lingi. All those things uh, are appealing to me because, number one, it's AP, and number two, they're limited. Number three, have you met Francois, and if so, can you tell him that a remaster collection should include the star wheel? This time, more thought into it instead of putting it in a millinery case, maybe a Jules Audemars case, throw a turbine in as well, you know, get creative. Also, when you get a remaster 01 in, can you talk about it? Uh, well, you have no idea how many times I wish I could sit at the board meetings or design meetings of a lot of these companies, not just with Audemars Piguet, but many of them say, guys, just little changes. I mean, I know what people like, right? I know what sells well, I know what's going to sell well, but unfortunately, I don't have a say in that. A, I'm a gray market dealer, and B, listen, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. Who am I for them to listen to me, right? I do agree the star wheel, right, from AP would be a great idea. If that thing went into a Royal Oak today, it would be through the roof, right? And then uh, as far as the remaster or one, I'm already getting questions about that particular watch. I don't have one in yet, but I certainly will talk about it separately in another video for sure because there's a lot of, there's a lot of negativity, much like there was with 1159. There's a lot of positivity, right? Uh, like I said, I'll talk about this in a separate video. I am more on the positive side in regards to that watch than the negative. I do like the watch uh, because it has that vintage feel, because it's a remaster, right? And that's probably why I like it. Uh, but I will try to get one in here and talk about it in detail. Uh, number four, what's your take on brown dials in general? Do you think there are new colors for the fall? I'm not, I don't really favor dials because it's such a broad topic because certain dials look better with certain watches. So to generalize every watch with a brown dial to be, you know, I, to be something that I like or hate, I really can't. It really depends the watch that it's on. Right, so you know, I don't mind brown dials on certain watches, and on some watches, they just look terrible. Right, a rose gold watch with a brown dial or a chocolate dial looks amazing, like a Sky Dweller or a Royal Oak. Right, you take that same brown dial and you put it in a stainless steel watch, I, I, to me, it loses effect. So, it's really hard to generalize that. And as far as to dub it new color for the fall, I mean, <laughs> I guess it makes sense. Brown fall do go hand in hand. Last question Royal Oak Turbion ET purple sunburst dial, does it exist? Can you show one and your thoughts? It does exist. I don't have one in stock. I have sold one. And to me, and as far as my opinion on the watch, I like it just as much as I like any other Royal Oak Turbion, right? But I will tell you this, that, you know, if you put a blue dial Royal Oak Turbion, or matter of fact, any other regular color, whether it be black, white, or blue, right, your standard three colors, next to a purple one, nine out of 10 guys will reach for one of those colors. If you're going to go out and buy one of those, you really have to be sure that this is something that you like, because it's very, very different which makes it harder to resell, right? It's impossible to find because they only made so few of them, right? But once you get it, it's very tough to resell it because purple is a pretty specific color. Not everybody wants to be out there wearing Barney on their wrist, if you know what I mean. I, I like the sunburst dial to begin with, and I do like the purple because it is different. I like stuff that's different. So if this is something you're looking for, by all means, go out there and get it. But keep in mind, if you try to resell it at a later time, it's going to be a catch-22, which will probably even out because it's super hard to get, but it's also not a typical color, so it's harder to sell, but for the most part, those two should even each other out, and you should be just fine. Hope that answers your question, and this is it for me for today, guys. Uh, remember, I appreciate all your questions. Email them to romansharf at luxurybazaar.com. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber to my channel. And most of all, as I always ask, please share this video with your friends because this is what helps my channel grow organically. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday.